uh, in terms of the background and context of that photo, as well as the impressions and reactions that they've had since then. And we'll also allow for some time for what has grown to be a very, very large crowd, uh, which we're very happy. So initially what I'd like to say is, Marianne, welcome back to Emerson College. Even though I think we are practicing social distance, you're in Florida and we're in Boston. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, my friends. Thank you, everyone, and for also, being here today. This is a very important day. Okay, and also John Philo. John, welcome back. I know you're in New Jersey, so it's good to have you. I would like to say to everyone gathered before we ask Mary to give her, her thoughts as well as John about this photo and the time, uh, next spring we'll be hosting a 50th, actually 51st retrospective as we did for the 20th and 25th. So we will be doing that in Boston and I will be giving you all the details later. We've got Mary as well as John and others who will be a part of that. So Mary, as we think back, May 4th, 1970, can you give us your ideas and thoughts of that day as well as up to and after that picture? Well, on that day, it, it was a beautiful day, May 4th, 1970, and uh, I had went back to the campus, and uh, they said there was going to be a peaceful protest where the Liberty Bell was. So people gathered there, you know, free-spirited people, smart people, concerned people, people that was against the war, and we were going to have a peaceful protest there. And uh, as people gathered, it, it, it just seemed like all of a sudden, here comes the National Guard. National Guard was told to apparently have us leave. And we felt at that time it was all right on a U.S. campus. We thought we were safe. I thought I was safe, me and my dog. And we would give our support to bring our troops home from the war. And so you were there, he, what happened uh, yes. when you came in? When, when the National Guard came, they started approaching us and they started throwing tear gas and, you know, one thing led to another and they started coming and people were dispersing, never thinking anybody was going to get shot. This is, you know, nobody's ever experienced anything like that on the campus. We, we thought we were protected. We, were, we thought we were protected by the First Amendment. We thought we were protected by all the amendments. We were American citizens and we had the right to protest. And they, it just escalated and they were coming towards us and people were backing up and they just kept coming and coming and people dispersed during the tear gas. So it was just, you know, it, it was just a big smoke. People dispersed. I ran into uh, Taylor Hall with my dog. I, I left my dog in there and I, I went back out and I had to put a handkerchief over my, my face and I went back out, didn't think anything of it, you know, was moving with the people, and all of a sudden the shots fired. I, I kissed the ground right there. So uh, what you're saying is, well, after the guard was on the practice football field, most people thought that they were going to return back at the ROTC, and everyone thought it was over when they got to the top of the hill. You went into Taylor. So you said when they came back out, suddenly they turned and fired. So you were not expecting anything like that. I was not expecting anything like that. And uh, that's, uh, it, it just, everybody was dismayed. I mean, they couldn't believe it. They just, they just couldn't believe it. They, you know, people were just frozen in time and, People didn't know what to do. You know, there was there was nobody out there, you know, rallying for us. 
telling us what to do. And it, the campus didn't seem to know what to do. And it, you know, it just became a mayhem and people were just running for their lives. They, they were shooting all the car windows out. They shot out the dormitory windows. I mean, this, this was in the United States. So, you know, you just got to remember kids were kids back then. You know, they'd never experienced anything like this. And, uh, you know, a lot of people felt they had a right to protest, but majority of the people were really scared and dismayed. And then I looked around, there was people dying. There was a Laurel Krause, she was dying. Sandra was dying. And I went over to Jeff and I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it. I, I seen the back of his head. It, it was blown apart. I, I, I could see the inside of his head and I just, I, I just, I, I just lost it. Like my mind, I just lost it. I seen all that blood. No, nobody was helping us. <laughs> nobody. So you had a situation there, Mary. Um, according it's, to the yeah. commission, they said that there was a problem with leadership of all levels in society. Uh, of course, we have you over the body of, Jeff Miller in that iconic pose. What was going through your mind at that time? Uh, you couldn't help. You, he wasn't moving. He couldn't be helped. It, the, the blood kind of spoke for itself, but I didn't kind of see that in my mind until I had looked afterwards at the, you know, his face and the people just, you know, it was, it was just too much. It was just too much. Uh, we, you know, you, you, you felt drained and lost. You didn't know what to do. I was so scared, so scared. And I was a runaway, you know, I wasn't a student. I was a runaway and, uh, I start, and you know, I, I ran, I ran for a day, started getting buses ready and I jumped on one. But uh, it, it was awful. There was nothing anybody could do. And you just, you just were helpless. You just were totally helpless. Yes. Well, you know, we didn't, have cell, we didn't have cell phones back then. We had nobody to call. There was no way to get any help. You know, it's, we were surrounded. There was no talking, no pleading, no nothing. This, this was it. And except we didn't know about it. This was a, apparently a plan that we didn't know about. And uh, I think that's, uh, you, you have to take a look. You have to take a look at that and, and, and visualize the time 50 years ago. You know, so I end up going to uh, Indianapolis. I, I ran away as fast as I could. I was so scared. I was afraid people were after me. I, I, I didn't know what this banker say. I just was totally scared and uh, didn't know what to do at that time. Yes. Thank you, Mary, for that very, very moving perspective of what it was like uh, and in terms of your reactions. If we could go to John Philo, what I remember most about when I first met John, John said, well, I was a student at Kent State. I was a journalism student. Could you take us through what got you to that, that moment where you took the picture, which has been judged one of the most important and influential pictures of the century, uh, John, tell us about Kent State from your perspective. Um, it was a tough day. It was a tough afternoon. I had missed everything. Um, I had three roommates that were photographers. And by the time I returned to campus on Sunday afternoon late, everyone had missed everything. I'd missed the burning of the OTC building, the Governor Rhodes uh, brown shirt speech, uh, the trashing of the town. And as a journalist, I felt so bad because I was doing like macro view camera work with T-berries and moss. 
and um, yeah, everyone, all my roommates were working for national publications. Um, so when Monday came around, I, I thought it was over. Basically, everything was over, and um, I had to open the labs. I was the lab assistant, head lab assistant, opened the labs from 8 until 12. All during that morning, uh, people said, well, you're going to go to the rally at noon? And I said, what's happening at the rally at noon? And, and everyone had sort of had a different story. One was there was going to be a student strike. Um, it was a protest against the war. It was a protest against the escalation of the war. And um, uh, I'm thoroughly depressed. I mean, as far as I was concerned, uh, it was big news. Campuses all over the United States were in an uproar about the Cambodian incursion, as the White House called it, invasion, as sane people were calling it. Um, I had two great professors. One was a working photojournalist, Charlie Brill. The other one was a crazy mad scientist, experimental photography kind of guy, Henry Beck. At different times that morning, and they said, "You know, the story's changed. It's now student protest in America." I was a student of sort of student protest and, and, and looking at the history of uh, World War II, and uh, and they said, "Yeah, that's that's what the story is now. You, yeah, you missed the news, uh, but now it's it's let's go look for uh, uh, how the country is dealing with student protest in America." So I had an hour off. We closed the labs every day from twelve to one. Uh, simple assignment. It happened at Taylor Hall where I worked. I mean, literally, it was like going out your back door uh, to your backyard, which was happened to be the commons of the university, the crossroads of the university. By the time I shut everything down, uh, the victory bell was ringing. There was the hardcore group of two, three hundred students down by the bell. And you had the whole commons ring with students who weren't there over the weekend. It was a big commuter school. You had several thousand students watching what was going on. So the, um, uh, the idea of me trying to get a picture of student protest in America, there was this, the National Guard on one side of the commons, let's say at the end of the football field and the students at the other end of the football field. So being a, uh, a, journalistic, a journalism student, photo I was in photo illustration also, um, uh, you know, I was trying to get this, you know, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. And I was like, where would I be to get the, you know, the student demonstration in America? And uh, had a wide angle lens. That's all the lenses that were left in the equipment locker. Uh, the stuff was all gone. Uh, had, had a camera. Ran into Howard Ruffner, the editor of the yearbook. He was the Air Force veteran. He had all the equipment anyone could dream of because uh, he brought it back with him from uh, Southeast Asia. Lent me a normal lens, pretty much, a 43 to 86. And that's what I used. Uh, after the tear gas barrage, after the order, you know, uh, your, the barrage came after saying that the assembly was illegal. Um, the gas would blow away, the students would return. Finally, the guards started moving across the commons, broke up into two sections. I would say the bulk from the commons went around the right side of Taylor Hall saying about 100 guardsmen, a smaller detachment, maybe a, a smaller troop, uh, two squads, something like that, went around the left side. I followed the left side only because it was led by a sergeant that had this like four foot nightstick. And he looked like he was looking for someone to use it on. And I said, well, this is, if I'm going to get my close enough photo, maybe I'll follow this group. Uh, nothing happened as, as the guard marched across the commons up the hill. And over the hill, the students gave way. And they back, you know, just that that buffer, that 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 thing that I couldn't close with a long lens. I couldn't pull them together at all. Uh, nothing happened with the squads that I followed up on the left side of the hill. But when I did look over uh, to what happened to the bulk of the guardsmen, they had formed two squads of rifle lines. One aimed at the students in the parking lot, and one aimed at another section of the parking lot, and. Um, the rest of the guard was just milling around in the background on this football field practice, uh, football field, rugby field. And, uh, and then this lone student sort of descended the embankment waving a black flag. And I went, oh, uh, here we go. Here's, here's something that could be a great picture. And so getting myself in position to get behind this, this person with the black flag, the kneeling guardsmen pointing their rifles, I, you know, I was amazed. I said, this is it. This is my picture. This is my self-assignment. I was so pleased with 
with uh, this is how student protest in America is being met, this armed mass force with bayonets and rifles. Uh, I, uh, I, I think I remember trying to figure out, oh, this is what, it's, it's like, this thing's over, you know, the guard looks like they're reforming, going back to their start point uh, of, the, uh, of the burnt out ROTC building that they had a per giant perimeter around. Um, and as they went back up the hill, uh, the students came back, you know, they were in the parking lot and around the buildings taking shelter. And from my point of view, as I went up the walkway, um, the guard disappeared from my view. They, 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 crested the hill and, and I said, well, that's, you know, I was like, well, this is great. I'll have time to have some lunch and open up the labs again. But it, that thought quickly was dispelled because they reappeared on the crest of the hill and began firing. Now, I thought this was unusual and a scare tactic because I saw no reason for it. And uh, I wanted to get a picture of it. And of course I'm dodging with the camera, I'm dodging people that are fleeing uh, the gunfire and uh, I'm thinking, well, this is the strangest scare tactic because, you know, the wadding in those blanks can put out an eye or, or something. I, I had no uh, idea it was live ammunition until I was ready to take that picture. And the guard pointing a rifle in my direction, his gun goes off, the sculpture in my line of sight erupts into this cloud of rust, the bullet penetrates, and hits a tree beside me, knocks off a chunk of bark, and I went, Oh, some idiot uh, is using live ammunition. I had no idea. I mean, also there was a bullet went by your, you know, your left ear. Um, I, I dropped the camera. It sort of came to the realization I'd just been shot at and uh, and missed. Uh, I think I, my first question was, am I in a state of shock? Have I been shot and don't know it? Because the people behind that sculpture are wounded. There are people on the ground. There are people on the ground taking refuge behind that sculpture, but there's also someone hit there. And uh, I, I sort of checked myself to see, maybe I'm hit, I don't even know it. Uh, turn to my left and you'd see, as you did this slow turn, you see people trying to hide behind a, a street sign post or a curb that's four inches high. And finally get to the body of Jeffrey Miller. I mean, this is a few seconds after the shooting and the the amount of blood is enormous. I mean, it, it is, it's, I mean, the volume is incredible. And uh, not being a doctor, but I said, uh, that person's dead. I, I mean, you, you just, I don't care if he died in the arms in an emergency room, there's no way you're gonna save this person. That person is, is dead. So I, I moved to the body of Jeffrey Miller. I think I, I was, I wanted to flee, I really did. And I stopped myself when I got down to where his body was from the hill, uh, turned and I think the first picture I made is um, a woman with her hands to her head, staring at the body, you know, a good 15 feet away. Uh, there's a, another student sort of with his head down, the body's on the thing, and then there's a, a woman running up the street, which is Mary. Uh, the next frame is she le she's kneeling next to the body uh, the people in the picture are now looking to the crest of the hill where the firing came from for help, uh, gesturing like, hey, the man down uh, over here. Um, I wanted to get around that, that person. It was also, the shot was more in profile, and I knew I was running out of film. It was uh, bulk loaded film, student film. I didn't know if I was going to have 36 exposures or 42 exposures or whatever. You lose count. And uh, I wanted to get um, a picture of, of that tableau of, of the woman next to the body, uh, more head on. And I was having this debate whether to shoot the picture or not. And then you could see in Mary this emotion building. You could see her absorbing all of this. And, and, and I think I made one frame of her looking at the body. And then the very next frame I made as I'm moving closer and moving, try, trying to move closer, she let out with a scream and, and the debate was over and I shot the picture. I think I was able to make one, one and a half or almost two pictures after that. And I was, the film was done. I had to change film. But I elected to stay with the body of Jeffrey Miller because uh, I knew he was dead. Um, the people up behind the sculpture to me were alive and seemed to be being tended to, but 
I, I, this was to me uh, the atrocity. Was, was this person way down the hill in the street uh, on the driveway and, and, and dead? I had no idea that the other persons that were killed were further back than Jeffrey. You know that they're in that parking lot and there's a poor Sandy Sure was going into her dorm. I mean, I had no idea that happened. Um, you know, I thought this was the only person uh, that was struck and killed. Keep in mind, carrying a camera on campus uh, back then, the paranoia of the times, uh, no one really liked you. I mean, the students thought you were working, you were an undercover working for some law enforcement or <laughs> federally funded group of, of, of rounding up demonstrators. And the, once again, and if anyone in law enforcement thought you were there for the police brutality photos. So as, as a, even as a student photographer, you had, you had a rough time. You had, I, I remember I had people screaming in my ear um, the whole time I'm shooting those pictures, like what kind of pig am I to shoot, the, uh, shoot these photos? And I said, I think I responded once. And I said, no one's gonna believe this happened. And uh, stayed with the body of Jeffrey Miller until it was removed. Uh, saw some other strange stuff, the person dipping the flag in the blood and spewing it on other people. Uh, there was a large contingent, uh, another couple, maybe 200 people that went and sat on the commons and said, sent an emissary to the guard, said, why did you shoot? And the reply that came back, if you don't disperse, uh, we're gonna shoot again. And no one left. And that's the most afraid I think I was the whole day. The other one was just stupid, blind ignorance. But this was a willful decision to stay with this group who were vocally uh, protesting the shooting and stuff. Now, we didn't have cell phones, but we had a few people had transistor radios. And within maybe a half hour of the shooting, I don't know the exact time frame because everything time is sort of suspended as you're, as you're living that thing. I mean, the shooting seemed to take forever. It was 13 seconds or so or whatever. Um, the initial radio reports said two students and two guardsmen killed in shootout. So the paranoia of the times, I mean, come on, the generation in, in school at that time, you know, by, when we were in high school, we saw the, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And while we were in college, we saw the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. So the fact that the first radio report you're hearing is that two students and two guardsmen are killed. And if you were in that, you knew what a total pile of crap that was. And um, no one, like, like I said, in that group, no one left. And so I think if it wasn't, I mean, that's when you had Glenn Frank and a few other professors start really with bullhorns pleading uh, for the students to disperse. And uh, thank God a, a second contingent of guards showed up and, in, and sort of encapsulated that group on the commons. So that put us between uh, that new group of guardsmen and the guardsmen that did the shooting uh, that were now back at their start point at the ROTC. And everyone moved uh, to the tennis courts away off the commons. And then within a few minutes, it seemed like the university was closed. You know, the people that were pleading us to leave now were walking around saying, the university's closed, go home, see you later. Uh, so you're just sort of the day ends that way and, and you don't know what to do. I mean, I had a run in with the local newspaper there at the Akron Beacon Journal where they had, I shot demonstrations for them. They had lost my film and then couldn't get it back to me. Um, <laughs> I wanted, I was still, you were still hearing radio reports, bad, bad reports of two guardsmen and two students killed in a shootout. Uh, you knew this wasn't true, but that's what was being played on the airways. And so I elected to say, I got to get this, my story out, I got to get the photos out. So I elected to drive back to Pennsylvania where I could at least trust the paper I worked at and worked at since high school. And was the, paper of my mentor, Eddie Adams, who two years prior uh, shot the street execution in, in Saigon of General Luan shooting the handcuffed terrorist in the head. Um, it was, it was uh, you know, that 
I just wanted to get back there and at least have the film um, where I could trust it, trust, you know, being in my possession. Um, to make that trip, I was so paranoid, I hid the film in the Volkswagen I was driving. I filled my pockets with blank, blank rolls. I was, I, I, as I was leaving campus, uh, immediately after they closed it, the, the first sight that caught me and, and really put up the level of, of paranoia was, the first thing I saw was a guardsman on a telephone pole cutting the phone line. I'm not talking a power line, I'm talking about the phone line. And I'm saying, now that's unusual. It's not a, it's not a telephone guy. It's not, you know, it's, it's a guardsman dropping, literally lopping the phone line, you know, the inch and a half or so cable, you know, coming down off the pole cut. And I said, oh, this can't, this can't be good. So, uh, Basically, I didn't call anyone or talk to anyone until I crossed into Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, let me know if I'm going on too much here. I'm, uh, Greg? You're not. One thing I would like to just ask you, because you and I have discussed this, uh, the idea they were cutting the phone lines, uh, there's been a lot of chatter with regard to that this year. And the idea that you went to, I think it was Terratown, Pennsylvania, where you said, I'm across the Ohio lines. Many students that I've talked to, friends have said, they thought literally when they saw the buses coming to pick up students, that, and the buses were driven by guardsmen, that the guard was literally going to load everybody up and take care of everybody. So this paranoia, it might seem, well, maybe not so given the era we're in. But you were very concerned about them taking your, your photo or your camera and the film and not being able to show the world what you and Mary have shown, correct? Correct. Yeah, there were guardsmen everywhere at every intersection. All the lights were on, um, flashing paws. You know, you had to go through a guard point. I had to go, to get back to my room, which was literally a block off campus, I had to go through three checkpoints. And uh, each, each one was a little more trying than, than the first. Uh, and, so you were given, what, a couple of hours to get off campus, and yet the same people that had caused the issue who had turned around and fired into the crowd in, a, in an act which the President's Commission said was unwarranted, unnecessary, and inexcusable, were then going to help you get off campus. So it seemed to be a problem with trust. Oh, yeah, big time. I, that, exactly. That's why I wanted to get out of town, basically, and get out of the, get out of the state. But you, okay, that's what's interesting, because I think uh, you didn't want to just get out of town. You went all the way across the state because of Governor Rhodes's divisive rhetoric. Uh, were you relieved when you finally went to this very small town and said, here, here's a picture that you might want to get out? Well, um, I was relieved that I was out of Ohio. I was relieved that, uh, here's, here's the problem. I was a student, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a real professional, okay? And so when I called the paper, when I got to the first rest stop on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, I called my paper and my boss answered the photo, you know, uh, he picked it up and he said, well, did you, did you get any good pictures? <laughs> and I said, um, I think so. And the reason I said, I think so is because I can remember seeing pictures, but I couldn't remember taking pictures. I knew I started the day with six rolls in my right pocket and ended the day with six rolls in my left pocket. But I, I can't honestly remember, you know, I remember the Alan Canfor black flag photo, I, but I don't remember, I remember seeing it and I remember seeing Mary Vecchio, I remember seeing all these photos, but I don't remember taking them. And this, you know, uh, this is back before automatic cameras and automatic focus. So the sun was in and out of the clouds all day. So you were constantly adjusting uh, f-stop and speed. Um, and I said, I think so. And I, I had the presence of mind when I took the Mary roll out of the camera to scratch the cassette. So when I got to the paper, which was late afternoon, it was a two and a half hour drive in my speedy Volkswagen that could maybe do 55 downhill. Um, um, I, they, they had a new processor, uh, 
an automatic film processor, which was a shock to me because everything used to be hand, hand dipped. And uh, before I had trust that role, I had to put in a lesser role and then, you know, required a leader and all this automatic processing. And we put, then we put the role with Mary on it uh, and said it'll be near the end and, and all that. So um, it was a real fight. By the time we had that picture printed, I had the publisher in, in, the, in our photo area and um, saying, well, this is great. Let's hold, the, let's hold these photos until tomorrow's publication. Mm -hmm. And I had to remind him, I said, look, the story hasn't changed with two students, two guardsmen killed. Uh, I want, we need to get these out to the wire. And uh, uh, it was a big argument. It was a fight. It was a fight. And I said, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not we're not waiting. If, if you're not going to release these to the AP, I'm, I'm going to move on down the road, go to, go to Pittsburgh or somewhere. And, uh, you know, another 40 minute drive or so. And, uh, um, get the photos out that way. The, um, what had happened is we sort of negotiated a deal. We, we, he said, I'll tell you, I, and luckily it worked for everybody. He said, let's put the pictures out. And I said, how about we just put the name of the paper underneath on the caption? You know, you'll, your paper will get credit. And, it, uh, you know, and, and, and I'll feel good about getting these pictures out. So that was, that was the fight. And then when we, when I finally did get to the, AP network, um, you know, you had a call letter. You had a three letter call letter, which ours was TAR1, uh, and the picture would be number one. Uh, TAR1, I had to schedule it to the network. And this is analog days. And no matter what was going on in the world, you could literally move 120 black and white photos a day. I mean, you had to have discussion in between, you had to have sports, features, news. Uh, you, but you still had to maintain you know, the, the analog time, eight to 12 minutes to transmit a picture with a decent caption. Um, every time I tried to schedule this picture, I was blown off the network because they said, well, there's this big news event that happened in Ohio and we're taking pictures from the Ack and Beacon Journal. And, uh, and I kept trying to tie the guy in the, in the moments that you had in between transmissions. I said, well, I don't think they came over the hill and he go and the guy was obviously had no idea what I was talking about. And the idea was most of the professionals that showed up that day stayed and, and had the sticks uh, and were set up at the, at the base camp of the Brown and ROTC building and, and covered the march across the commons uh, like everyone else thinking that was the dispersal of the demonstration. Uh, day would be over. Uh, everyone goes back to uh, you know, normal life. Um, basically what I was trying to say is none of the professionals came over the hill. Uh, all the photography that came out of there was done by student photographers uh, on the shooting side of, of the blanket hill. And so having an argument with New York as to scheduling a picture, finally the, out of frustration, the guy called me, uh, as they say, long distance. And he said, look, you know, this guy was like a politics. He said, look, I, you, you don't seem to know what's going on. There was shooting. I said, no, 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 you don't seem to know what's going on. <laughs> I, I was there and I'm, you know, and he, he was trying to figure out what the heck I was doing 120 miles away, trying to transmit a picture from Kent. And I wasn't about to explain the whole day to him. And I just said, well, I think it's a good picture and I think you're going to want it. And so what had happened, the Akron Beacon Journal, uh, back then, um, the transmitters we had were built in the 30s and 40s. It was an optical bench on a rotating micro groove drum. You know, uh, it had a phase electric motor, throw a clutch, and the op optical bank had to be precisely focused. And uh, it turned a black and white photo into about nine shades of black to, to white. And uh, that's how you transmitted pictures back then. Um, what had happened is the Akron Beacon Journal, they were on like their number 10 photo from the day. Um, the caption or the print either dried strangely and it lifted off the optical bench. It only took like a 16th of an inch and it went out of focus. So while they were re-wetting or re-drying that print, they said, well, we're going to take this picture from Trenton, PA, this TAR1 uh, as sort of 
so we don't have dead time on the network. And uh, that's how I got the picture. Mary out, uh, went out. We sent it out several times. It was a regional transmission, then a national, then international, I think. Yes. I think, uh, I think it's fascinating to, uh, to hear that story. One thing I would like to mention is the two had never met, even though they had been connected, almost family members uh, with regard to that photo. And in 1995, I had spoken to John. I'd also known Mary. And I said, could you come to Emerson? Because I think it's very important for you to meet. And Mary uh, said she would because she thought the whole world needs, needs more communication, which is what Emerson's about. John, if I can just share your thoughts at the time, John said, I'm a little bit reluctant to because I feel as though I trapped her in that photo and Mary can talk about some of the issues that she had afterwards, but he was concerned about the fact that he'd kind of victimized Mary in that photo. And what I'd like to do briefly, and then we'll go back to Mary to talk about her, some of her insights afterwards is uh, we have a piece of, uh, footage in 1995 when, of course, it's not going to be the best quality. John, you as well as David Burnett will be critiquing it. But it's the first time the two of them had met. We brought them together and gave them a, a communication award because we thought, as Mary said to me, John and I helped in the war in Vietnam. So if we could see this piece. Throughout the day, we've had a stimulating discussion about how this photo has been a, an etched capture in our minds in terms of that entire epic of history. So, Mary and John, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. My father, he, he passed away in 1984. And uh, he's given me a lot of courage. And uh, if he's looking at me in heaven, down from heaven, then I know he will be proud that a college in Princeton has given me an award and that I go on through life and try and teach people that communication is the way to go. Thanks very much uh, for this, but um, especially thanks for uniting me with the subject. Uh, okay, thank you very much for for that, Mary. If we could uh, go to you to talk a bit about after that particular piece. Uh, can you tell us what it was like? You saw that picture that John had worked very hard to get in. What was it like for you? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. I, I didn't quite hear you. You said it after the, after the Emerson meeting? Well, the Emerson meeting, we were very happy that the two of you met and uh, I was very, very pleased, as you said, you wanted to be a part of the play that we were doing, and you went to Kent and told your story. But after the picture came out, that was, has, you know, a very iconic picture with you expressing the horror. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like for your life after that? Uh, you cut out, Dr. Payne. Could you tell us a little bit about what it was like in your life after the picture got out and everyone saw you as the girl in the Kent State photo? Uh, uh, first of all, I didn't want to be found. Yes. I was so scared. So, I've, you know, I, 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 was, af I was afraid I was um, pinpointed like a dartboard, dartboard. You know, I just, I, I maybe have made more of it, but I was really scared. I was just scared of everything. I mean, I was a runaway, and uh, all I wanted to do was hide. 
at that time. And, uh, you know, uh, Indianapolis reporter had uh, had an interview with me, and then the uh, apparently they called the they called the FBI, and uh, I, I was just extremely scared. I just didn't know what to do. I was so scared. I didn't know if I was going to be arrested. I, I've just always been on pins and needles since then, you know, and. Back then, I was just very fearful, very fearful. You know, we we didn't do anything wrong. And I kept saying we didn't do anything wrong. So, you know, since your, since that time, you have done so many remarkable things to help people. Uh, did you you did say to me and John that you thought that photo helped in the war. Could you talk a little bit about that? You also said it yes. yes. Okay. So Mary, you're with us, correct? After after I realized what was going on and put things together in my mind. I, I knew it was for the better. I knew deep down inside it was for the better to get the, get the Vietnam veterans home and the war. I, I just knew that it was a better thing for, for everybody. I just, I just was very fearful and, but I knew it was the right thing to do. That you've uh, you have been very open about speaking classes, classes, and you're you're here now. I guess for John as well as for how do you compare the division now with the division then? It will open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, Doctor Payne, you're cutting out. Yes, can you hear me better now? Yes, I can. I'm sorry. I was asking if you and John could talk about, uh, there was an Emerson poll that talked about, are we more divided then than now? And even people who were living then believe we're divided more now than we were then. What do you all think about it? Mary? What I, what I think about it is that back then it was society. You know, that's the way we were, uh, parents were taught. That, that's the way the system was back then. You know, and uh, I guess they had their own fake news going on, and uh, that's what they 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 divided us because they they had to do that. They had to divide us. And you see this. And today, now. and today, and today, it's the same thing. It's like rewriting, re rewriting it, and it's coming out the same way. They are. It's fake news. Everything's fake news. Everything's hyped up. Conquer and divide. Um, turning people against each other. It, it's almost like identical. It, I, I know that's the way it feels towards me. And I feel, I, I said to myself, as a society, I have to be a better person. I can't get sucked into that again. No matter what I think, how I feel, how I vote. Uh, I, I have a mind of my own today, and we have much more com better communication system today than we had back then. And I think that people have a better chance of getting the truth than back then. You know, so you know, uh, I, I thank God for that. I thank God for the open lines of communication where you can speak to somebody and gather gather your thoughts together and, and work things out. And I think that back then at Kent State, that's what we were trying to do. We just didn't have cell phones. And I think that people knew it was the right thing to do. The war was not right. It it wasn't good for our country. It wasn't good for 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 the world. And I think that today we have a much better chance. I, I think we have a better chance to get a hold of this 
and and I think the universities they they need to to talk about this. They need to communicate with their students. They need to talk, teach teach the kids today what happened fifty years ago, so they they won't make the same mistakes. You know. One thing I would like to say, before we go to John, uh, it's fascinating because most of the class that uh, are in the Kent State Jackson State Seminar are listening today. So, John, before we get to your views on the vision, Mary, could you give us your perspective? What is the message of Kent State to this to the generation today? The, it, it's true reporting. When, when you write something down, when you when you when you're at your communication desk, make sure you got the right information because a lot of people are listening and a lot of people look up to to the TV reporters, the commentators, the people have they have the communication in their hands and, and they need to disperse it rightfully to the public, truthfully, and uh, so. We can, as a country, make decisions. And if we have good communications, we will make good decisions. And, and we, won't, we won't have another Vietnam. I mean, this is our, our time to shine. I think with this pandemic today, with the, with the viruses going around, I think that this is giving us pause. It's resetting the world to, to let people know that we can make a difference and we, we don't have to have this violence and we, we just need to be honest with ourselves. And I think the outcome will, uh, will be much better after this pandemic. Just like Andrew Cuomo in New York, I listened to him. He, he gives a synopsis of what's going on with the pandemic. You know, he's telling the truth. I, I believe he's telling the truth. And he, he's making me relaxed. He's, people are getting a grip on it. People ain't, they're not fearful. You know, we just need the truth. And I think that people know how to lead themselves, their families, their communities. And I think that we can get a lot out of it. This, this might be the year. This might be the year for us to reset and go forward and, and be the best we can. Uh, it, it's not hard. It's not hard. And I, I just, uh, I'm just very hopeful. I, I'm just very hopeful with the young people today in the, in the colleges and universities. They're so smart. They're so vibrant. When I went to Boston, I seen all the people walking down the streets, all the students, and it just gave me just great hope that I know they're going to do the right thing. I know the young people will lead us out of this. I, you know, I'll be 65 this year, and I just, I'm just putting all my eggs in the basket that this generation will be the one to, to, to set us free. I, I just... I, I just have all my hopes and dreams in this, and I, I just really feel it. I, I feel very strong about this. I think this, this was a real wake-up call. I think this was the I think this was the Kent State 50 years today. I it's, think this. Well, Mary, thank thank you for those perspectives. I think what's ironic, and some people have pointed it out, that 50 years ago, many of us that are watching. Uh, didn't have class because of Kent State, because you had the first national strike. 50 years later, our students for the 50th anniversary, it's COVID. But John, in terms of some final comments, do you think we're more divided? Do you share the same type of uh, conviction and inspiration that Mary expressed? And I know that all the professors who are online do, that this generation can, uh, can get us out of this mess. Your thoughts? Uh, let me just go back 25 years. I just want to get this off my chest. Um, for all the students at Kent at that particular time, I think the more I talk to, I think we all, and, and, and I'm speaking 
I have no right to be speaking for everyone, but I think we all suffer some sort of post-traumatic stress um, uh, from that day. Um, and I remember by the time I finally met Mary 25 years ago at, at Emerson University, I had, you know, we had no counseling. It was like, go away, come back in the fall. Um, so for me and, and for many other there that, that survived, uh, it was a question of if you were close, how did you get missed? How did you survive this? Uh, how did I end up being the lucky one? And I remember finally when I got to Emerson 25 years later after the event, um, heard Mary speak. Here's a, here's a person, a subject of my, in, in my photo. And I'm thinking 25 years later, I finally got this all in, in a mental box that I can handle. Like, how did I survive? How did, you know, how, how am I surviving now? And then I hear her speak and you realize her voice, her attitude was that of a teenager. I mean, there were other people there. No one reacted uh, or got that close to Jeffrey Miller, but she did. She got there and she got down there and she wanted to help and she wanted to do it. And you realize her youth and her willingness to try to help. And then looking at the gore and horror that was before, her, that's what made my photo. I mean, it, 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 was, it was that, it was that element about her that made the photo, you know. There were other people that got close to that body and never, never had that reaction. Uh, I just wanted to put that out there that 25 years later as a photographer, you have a, that revelation being told to you by a subject in your photo. Um, I think the one thing I would like to add because I, it, it complements what John has said, Mary, when she came to Emerson, she saw the play that we had done based from the perspective of Florence Schroeder, Kent State of Requiem. And she watched it and she said to me, can I be in it? And I said, well, you certainly. Uh, so she said, I want to do something at the end where I talk about Plato passing the lanterns of knowledge to the next generation. And that's what we need to do, which she sort of epitomized today. So when we were at Kent State rehearsing, I saw Mary, Mary was getting ready to rehearse and Elaine Holstein, Jeff Miller's mother came over and was watching. And she said to me, I would like to meet her. And I had not realized something until then that they had never met. So I said, Elaine, this is Mary Vecchio. And Elaine looked at her and she said, it is so important for me to meet you because I want to ask you a question. Tell me the last moments of life of my son, Jeffrey. It was such an emotional event. And I'm sorry, even today it's problematic. But Mary embraced Elaine and they sat down and talked for about two hours. And I think that, um, you know, the, the power of both of you to bridge gaps, uh, to heal is so important. And I think for those people watching, it's so important to tell the story and to make sure we have these commonalities that both of these wonderful people have, have discussed. Uh, I know some of you said that you would like to have some questions. Uh, I think we could have a couple, but what I would say to all of you, and we've had a lot of people more than we ever thought in this. We are going to have, as I said, a retrospective, which will feature not only Mary and John, but some of the other people that tell their stories about Kent. Uh, the one thing I would say, and John alluded to him, there was one person who to me kept four from being 400. And for everybody that's interested in communication, that person was Glenn Frank. And as Mary and John both have said, after the shootings, the guard went over, reloaded, they were getting ready to march again. And the students had seen Allison, Bill, Jeff, and Sandy killed. And it was not a good situation. And Glenn Frank, a geology professor, not someone who had been schooled in Burkean rhetoric, pleaded and said, I'm pleading with your, if you, I'm pleading with 
my life, if you do not end and leave this area immediately, there's gonna be a slaughter. So I think for everybody here, the idea that we can't do anything, the very ability for us to sit and connect with people and to explain, and as Mary and John both have said, to, to try to find the commonality in an era that is extremely divided is important. I would say, John and Mary, my students prefer Instagram. And John and Mary were ahead of their time because that photo tells it all. So maybe we could have one question or two questions. Are you okay for a couple of questions? And yes. I, yeah, I am. Yeah. So we will have a couple of questions. Do we have someone who would like, Pete, I know you're there. Do we have some questions that have been listed here? Um, yes, hello. Uh, we have a couple in, and if anyone wants to write in a few, uh, we'll have about, you know, five minutes for questions. So um, one of the questions uh, comes from James Williamson. He said, did Marianne know Jeff from previous days? And in some versions of his photo there was something on your sweatshirt if you're comfortable talking about that um they wondered what that was they said well sure um you gotta remember i was a runaway i didn't have any that was that was all the clothes i had was his clothes on my back and uh you know how that goes and it, it's you, you know back then they had um you know, the girlfriend and the boyfriend, and they had like slave and master. Do you remember, do you folks remember that? Yes. Okay. That, well, that shirt happened to say slave, and it didn't mean anything else. And I have been asked about that, and it didn't mean anything. It was the only shirt I had. So, and I did not know Jeffrey before. I had never uh, been to Ken, Ohio just that weekend. So I did not know, but I was honored to meet his mother. And it really uh, re relieved a lot of mental worry, you know, what she thought of me and, you know, so forth and so on. So it, uh, I, w I was relieved to meet her and uh, I'll, I'll cherish that memory. Okay, we have one, John, uh, from yeah. Hattie Bullion. Uh, curious as to where the film is from the day. Was John able to keep possession of the negatives? Yes. Um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, since I was working for no one, I, I retained possession of all the film. I have it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I, what I would like to... Yeah. I, yeah. I'd like to say something. You know, I... I felt pretty empty for a long time and I, I went back to school and I ended up working in 2010 for the Veterans Administration. Isn't that ironic? I am a respiratory therapist and I, I took care of veterans for five years and I, I felt that was the most important thing I did and that how I could give back to veterans. And I, I had veterans from World War II on the beaches in Normandy. I've had Vietnam veterans. I, I've had veterans from Puerto Rico I took care of. And that, I, I just want to let you know that it was so uh, rewarding to me after that. And I just, um, I just feel very full of uh, gratitude for that, that I could give back to the veterans because I, I, I didn't hate the veterans. I, my father was a veteran. So it, it was all about giving back and, and I'm so glad I did. Uh, that, that was great. I just wanted to let you know how I feel. And in case there's any veterans listening. Well, I think maybe we probably need you to take care of veterans today, given COVID. But one thing I've always been very 
impressed by you and John is the humanity that you've shown after a very humane day. Uh, maybe in closing, and this is kind of a tough question, but I'll ask it. From your perspective, John, as well as Mary, what do you think was actually the cause of the shootings at Kent? Was it a conspiracy? Was it Governor Rhodes's rhetoric? Was it, as Mitchner said, an unfortunate situation? Uh, was it uh, Terry Norman? I mean, we've got all these different theories that are out there. From your own perspective, and this is just yours, so we're just respecting your view, or you can just say, still don't know. The reason I ask is that's been one of the most popular questions in our in our seminar class, Alex is nodding his head, uh, among the students today. Uh, you know, people ask me, did I hear an order to fire? And I tell people, I said, no. Uh, I, what I, all I remember is they disappeared from my view and reappeared, and when they reappeared, they were firing. So whatever happened, it happened over the crest of the hill or out of my eyesight. I couldn't see what was going on. The next thing I saw going on was them back on the top of the hill, firing downhill towards me and, and, and people behind me. Uh, I seemed to be, in looking at all the footage and all the diagrams, I seemed to be to the far, from their shooting position to the far left, just inside uh, the bullets that struck uh, the people around and in front and behind the sculpture and the sculpture. And then the next pattern seems to be right there at Jeffrey Miller. And I'm, I still don't know how I got missed, to be honest with you. I mean, that, that was a hard thing. It took years to figure and, and put it in a place. But um, no, I never heard an order. I never saw uh, a thing. But it was it was an organized reappearance. It wasn't like one guy came back and started it. Like, oh, I'm gonna, it was, the troop came back and began firing. So you know, an organized reappearance? Uh, Mary, from your perspective, what do you think caused or was the reason for the shootings at Kent? It was, um, it was a show of power. The, I mean, now that I see looking back, it, it was, uh, they, they had to harness this and uh, they had to quell the protest. It was getting, it was getting very strong. Remember, it, everybody was protesting the university. And before, before I even came to Kent, when I was in the ninth grade, I went to Miami Dade College and there was a protest going on there about the Vietnam War. And I took the day off and I went there because it, it was wrong, you know, it was very wrong. So I just, I think it's just, it was just a overall quashing of, uh, of the protesters. They had to get that underhanded. They had to get it, they had to get their hand on it, in other words and uh, stop us. We were getting too strong in the country. The protests were getting out of hand. And back then, maybe they thought that was their way to do it. You know? Okay. And, uh, what, what I would like to do is to thank Mary as well as John for coming today. I think in closing, especially at a school that's uh, the first communication department in the country, one that believes in communication, it's great to have two people who have helped communicate so much about that era with that one photo. And I think in retrospect, when you think of Spiral Agnew and others that said the next time you see people wearing brown shirts or white sheets, you should act accordingly. Or when President Nixon indicates that people who demonstrate are bums, or when Governor Rhodes indicates that the people at Kent are the worst type of people we harbor in America and he's going to eradicate the problem at Kent, some of the guardsmen said they took that to mean martial law. And I think for all of us, and this goes to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue too, we have to understand the power of language, uh, that language is a behavioral directive and that we could either divide or communicate or unite ourselves. And I think with events like this and with two very, very important friends and icons of that era, Mary and John, 
we remember not so much what divides us, but what can bring us together. Thank you so much as we remember May 4th, 2020. Thanks for attending the event. Thank you. Thanks for hosting it. We look forward to seeing you, John and Mary, and all of the people that are watching at Emerson next spring. Thank, Thank you, Mary. May, may I say one thing? You can say two uh, things. The, yes, I, I want to I wanna give great thanks to Dr. Lee Williams, the person of the year. He is our Paul Revere of 2020, 2019. He's the doctor in China who tried to tell his friends about this virus. And he, he, to me, is the Paul Revere. He was trying to communicate on his phone about it as long as I live. And uh, today we have uh, COVID-19, and I feel that it's up to the young doctors and everybody to get a good handle on this. And I think we, we're going to conquer this, and we are going to be a great world again. And I give thanks to everyone in the health care uh, business I, and I, the scientists. Science doesn't lie. And I, I thought about that the other night, and I said, you know, science doesn't lie. And uh, I think uh, we need to keep remembering that and don't let our guard down. Well, I think I love everybody. I love everybody. We love you, Mary. We hope you come back home to Emerson. I think the two, two things we've heard is credibility, critical thinking. Uh, what I would like to say in closing is remembering a good friend at Jackson State, Gene Young, who on the 25th was yes. at Emerson. Unfortunately, Gene is not with us. But as you know, 10 days from today, two uh, African-American students at Jackson State were killed. And in their memories, we remember our students at Kent as well as our students at Jackson. Take care, peace, and see you at Emerson next spring. Again, thanks, Mary. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Well, I love the day too. Yes. Thank you. See you, Mary. Thank you. Bye, John. Love Bye. you too. Love you. Love you. Stay well, please. You too.